Okay. Um, and this being live streamed. Thank you, uh, Peter. Yes, um, lecture number two. Um, I suppose you were all working on your assignment, so um, it will be a bit um, repeating, I think, what you have discovered yourself. And um, um, yeah, that's not bad. And again, if you have questions or remarks, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Um, this small group, so we work together. Now, the learning objectives, you know, um, what are we going to do today? Um, first, I want to start with that um, video. I assume you have all watched about the question who owns England. Um, then we have taken a closer look at the idea of rights, restrictions, responsibilities. And again, I have to emphasize that uh, I'm making it very simple. It is oversimplified. Um, and you will understand after this lecture why. Then we return to land administration to have a look at yeah, why do we have land administration. Um, and at the end, I will um, look at a specific case, how in the Netherlands, a land transaction works, and also the role of uh, the actors and then uh, especially land administration. Um, yeah, I ask you to, to uh, spend 60 minutes of your time to watch that video about the question, who owns England? Um, you saw that presentation by uh, Mrs. Uh, Paul Smith, um, who seems at times a bit angry about uh, not having the information, not able to obtain the information. Um, and I would invite you to, to answer the question um, uh, and um, please put on your camera um, to have a small discussion what, uh, what, what according to you, uh, what, what have you learned about uh, uh, seeing this video? Um, the first question is what, what, what was she or, or the team searching for? Maren, what, what, what was your uh, idea about that? You're still muted? Yeah. yeah thanks. <laughs> thanks. Uh, what she was searching for. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, I saw it last week, but I think. Um, at the end, she had a lot of information about uh, who owns um, uh, like land, but of companies and local authorities and rural things, but not really what um, the individuals uh, were owning the land or something. And she still want to work on that part i thought mm -hmm. yeah yeah she wants information about indeed who owns england yeah. uh Chrisanti, uh maren is referring to, to the information of individuals and companies and eh? that's also addressed in in her uh, in her speech um what is there a difference and then i um between information that land administration can share about companies and individuals. If you, what, what's your opinion? Could everything be open? Because it seems that if you uh, uh, look at the video, uh, in fact, what she asked is, uh, I want to know anything. Eh? Also transparency, full transparency. Would it be feasible to have a system of land administration where I can, just can go to an office and ask, I want to know all, uh, everything that's owned by uh, Mr. Ploeger, Mr. Ploeger. What is your opinion, uh, Crisanti? I don't think it's feasible and uh, I am not sure if it's like we will have some privacy issues. I don't think everyone wants to have all their data on, on what they own public to whoever asks. So there should be like, uh, yeah. A sort of protection for the privacy of that individual and also companies would could really profit from those data so without the like 
yeah, without asking the user or the owner of those properties. So there's like a conflict of interest there. Um, yeah. So. That's, that's right. Um, in that video, it is not uh, really addressed because they focus on companies and investors. Eh? The whole problem is the fact that they want to know who's investing in England, who's buying all this land to, to make profit. Uh, but indeed, uh, when you are talking about the information you want, um, you have to uh, take care about the privacy. And what is important to know is that the companies itself are not protected by those privacy laws, but individuals are. So indeed, if you look at, at uh, the, the, the privacy concerns, uh, you cannot have a system that's fully open, that you can just get all the information you want, and there should be some restrictions. Um, and indeed, uh, when they get uh, the information of uh, individuals, they can, uh, yeah, all the companies can sell it. I don't know. Uh, by the way, uh, I never uh, went back to that uh, assignment. I had the lecture number one about searching for your own parcel. Um, are there any people here now in the Zoom meeting who did a search for their parcel data? Um, oh, yes. yes. Yes, I did. Well, I, it was easily to find it, but then you had, of course, the the explanation with all the codes was not. I could not find exactly what all the codes meant in the in the object information. Mm -hmm. the, the explanation of the metadata was not uh, was not able to find that. Please. What 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 what, uh, what uh, was the source of your information? What do you mean? You went to the cadaster of PDOK. Yes, I went or? to the PDOK viewer. Okay. And then you did have some metadata, and I could find it somewhere else. What the explanation of the metadata was, but not all of it. Mm -hmm. on a different uh, on a PDOK uh, documentation but not everything right. so yeah. you do have the information but it's not uh, instantly uh, understandable for a, a layman yeah. Lay yeah. yeah that's really a problem I think with open data sets that you uh, find uh, that the, the data are there but, but the metadata is not clear or, uh, but it's more in, in the, the subject of uh, Bastian on uh, 1009, uh, we were going to deal with it, but indeed, that's a problem. Uh, but are there any uh, of us who uh, hit to those companies who are trying to sell you the information you can get from the cadaster or even as open data, so for free, that they try to sell to you? Did anyone have that experience? No. Yeah, this, the funny thing is that uh, at the moment you are going to search for information, uh, the, the, the advertising, it also depends on your search engine you use for the internet, that there are a lot of advertising by companies that always call, uh, have in their name, uh, mentioned cadaster, so they suggest that they are the source of the official information. But what they do is they just resell the information they get from the Dutch cadaster and try to, uh, yeah, to make money out of it. Um, okay, but now we went uh, from, from uh, the privacy concerns and we went to, to uh, making profit from it. But what's interesting, uh, I don't think we have to, to uh, spend too much time about this, otherwise uh, my lecture uh, uh, remaining time uh, will be extremely limited. But the funny thing is that uh, privacy concerns are not really mentioned. Eh? Why, why uh, you can't get in England uh, a lot of information, eh? even, even the cholesterol map. You cannot get, uh, she's referring to that, according to Inspire, uh, Peter also mentioned the last uh, week, that according to the European directive, that, that uh, they should open up that parcel data. But uh, in England, uh, the mapping agency is not very willing to do that. Uh, but one of the things I say is that we are making money out of it. And that's the reason we can sell it to you. But... Again, they also restrict reuse, eh? so you can buy it for a lot of money, but you cannot reuse it. And uh, the main reason is uh, they want to make a profit from it. Eh? We're earning uh, the money. So that's the reason why they uh, restrict the access to it. Um, what, what you see is the, when you look at it, that uh, we're talking about land administration. And in theory, uh, we're talking about, yeah, uh, I also mentioned the Soto, that it is very important as a foundation 
of uh, the modern economy to have access to the information uh, that we know who is the owner of a certain plot, but that in practice uh, the systems differ, uh, the, the differences between very open and extremely closed uh, systems. And that's maybe the main message. Uh, what I'm talking to today, uh, same like the lecture last week, is that we are talking about uh, very, um, uh, in very abstract terms, that always you have to uh, go into the system itself and to search uh, based on the main uh, uh, concepts how it really works. Yeah. So I'm not. It is impossible to say there is one system of land administration. It is even not possible to say there is the best system of land administration. It always depends on the context. And that's the same for when we have a look at uh, um, the rights, restrictions and responsibilities, because that also depends on uh, yeah, how land law, and land law is also an expression that's in fact used in common law countries, but I'm now using it as a uh, general term. Land law is everything that has to do with yeah, land tenure. What is land tenure? Uh, it's also a uh, very abstract term, you could say, but it's about the relation between people and the land. So how do you get uh, uh, land rights? Uh, what are your, uh, uh, what, what does it give to you? What, what powers? How can you use the land and how can you, of course, uh, transfer those rights? No, that's, uh, it's not really a legal term, land tenure, but it's, uh, we uh, you find often in literature about land administration. Uh, what's important, uh, there is not one system of land tenure worldwide. It is always depending on the context. So it differs between place and time. Uh, and depends uh, especially on the applicable laws and the institutions involved. Um, um, what's also important is to uh, realize that that's most of the time, uh, especially in the past, we were only talking about the formal systems about land tenure. So people who are just occupying uh, land, using that land without their rights uh, registered or um, uh, uh, yeah, for, for instance, in the, in the past, uh, when you had squatters, people just building and houses on, on land they found uh, somewhere uh, near a railway or uh, an airport um, uh, were considered to be illegal. Nowadays, we talk about that as informal. Uh, we recognize that these people are living there. Uh, of course, no question is if they can get uh, removed from that land, uh, that the, the, the registered owner says, now well, I want to use that. But on the other hand, uh, there's also in fundamental law, uh, fundamental rights in, in, uh, in uh, conventions, uh, we should realize that people have a right to live somewhere. Uh, so you cannot just say, well, you're illegal. Uh, no one is illegal. We can recognize you were informal. It is not registered. But on the other side, uh, hand, you can't go to court. You cannot just be thrown off the land without a good reason. So there's also informal tenure systems, uh, uh, informal settlements. And next to, uh, to it, uh, also customary uh, uh, land tenure. And this, uh, last week I, uh, I mentioned about the influence that uh, especially European countries had in countries as uh, areas as uh, Africa and Asia, where they uh, found the original people living there. And in fact, in the beginning, just ignored their rights, uh, took their rights, uh, removed their rights, and uh, grabbed the land. And, uh, but that's also ignoring the customary rights that people have on customary systems. So it is, in fact, we were, when we were having a look at land tenure, it is extremely complex. So keep that in mind. It is also fascinating, of course, but it is not simple. So don't stop at the formal level. Um, yeah, and uh, 
and the last thing, uh, continuum of land rights is also an interesting concept because there uh, the United Nations also recognizes that there can be several uh, land tenures next to each other. Eh? So you can have an individual ownership that's recognized under the formal system, but there can also be uh, customary interests by, uh, for instance, a tribe that, that uh, yeah, uh, travels uh, around uh, the area and uh, yeah, uses the land for for uh, to, for uh, maybe weeks or months, and then move on to another uh, area. And one of the uh, challenges when you're designing uh, or uh, improving system of land administration is uh, how can we uh, put those customary interests in, also in system. Uh, later we'll talk more about it when we are looking at the land administration domain model. But now uh, we are going back to uh, the legal foundation, you could say, uh, of land tenure. And the, then it is very important to realize that, uh, yeah, they differ uh, very much. Um, we have here a nice picture, uh, this from uh, Wikipedia. And even this is uh, simplified. Um, but what you can see here are the main systems um, uh, in blue, that is what we call civil law. Uh, in, uh, more pink uh, is uh, uh, common law. And yeah, next to it, you see also customary law, uh, Muslim law, so Sharia, and uh, also uh, see here in this system, uh, the Jewish law, so that's for Israel. Um, and then yeah, there can also be mixed legal systems. Um, when you look at this, uh, you see uh, in Canada, mixed legal systems. It's a mix between common law and uh, civil law. Uh, Scotland, uh, there's a mix between uh, uh, common law, um, but also influenced by Roman Dutch law. And the same applies to uh, South Africa. So it is, again, also here we have a main uh, topology. Um, but always you should invest your time to research the system itself and to see yeah, even when it is a civil law system, uh, there can be differences between one and the other country. For instance, the Netherlands, France and Belgium uh, have their origins in, in uh, uh, the civil law, uh, the origins in uh, the uh, codes of Napoleon. But the three countries uh, differ also in uh, the land rights, land tenure, um, uh, in, in specific uh, things. So we can compare them, we can understand them, uh, but uh, we should always keep in mind that uh, there can be a difference uh, between uh, one and the other country. Um, now I go back to, to what we looked can be considered, but again, I have to emphasize this very European uh, uh, Eurocentric uh, uh, point of view. Uh, but uh, for the very traditional is uh, that we have on the one hand the civil law and on the other hand common law. Uh, what's the civil law? That's, that's a law system that has very old roots because the origin is in Roman law so that developed about uh, 2000 years ago. Um, that was collected by uh, Emperor Justinianus uh, in uh, the years uh, 529 up to 534. Of course, he did it uh, himself, but uh, his uh, legal advisors um, started a project to collect all the sources they had. And it was on the one hand for written text by lawyers giving advice and on the other hand, uh, uh, directives given by the emperor. Uh, court cases uh, didn't collect at the time, uh, but that gave a certain body and it was called the Corpus Juris Civilis or the Codex. And in fact, the, 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 the word code uh, that's uh, used in, in uh, until uh, the day of today, as a collection of laws, um, comes from that. 
En het Roman law uh, was once forgotten, but was rediscovered in Italy, about the year 1200. And um, later on, and then again, we will meet the emperor, uh, the French emperor Napoleon, um, it was based on this Roman law, everything was modernized. And that has also to do with the French Revolution. What they want to do was as abolish the whole idea that uh, the king is the origin of all rights and that citizens only can get the rights from the king. Now, now the citizens are in charge. And what's interesting about Napoleon was that the whole concept of property was made uh, crucial in the whole system. Um, from that Napoleon, uh, quote by Napoleon, um, it spread all over mainland of Europe. And that could take uh, 100 years. For instance, in Germany, they had their uh, modern law books only in the year 1900. And from Europe, it spread further over the world. So uh, for instance, in Japan, um, when they wanted to modernize their, their, their uh, law, and also about uh, land tenure, they had to look what are modern laws in uh, Europe, and then they discovered that the Germans had the most modern law book. So in fact, there is a direct connection between Japan and Germany. And it's very similar because uh, the Japanese uh, had to look at, at uh, the, the, the German law and uh, use that as a basic to, to draft their own laws. Okay, that, that's the civil law. So that had a lot of uh, influence, uh, especially on the magnet of Europe. While on the other hand, we have the common law, and that, that, that is more based on the customary law and absolutely not influenced by the Roman law. And that or, uh, the origin lies uh, in, in England. Now, as uh, we have seen in that uh, map uh, on the previous slide, you can see that even with, in uh, the European, uh, sorry, uh, within the uh, uh, United Kingdom, there's a difference because the Scottish, on one hand, also used that common law, but on the other hand, were influenced by uh, the teachers in, in, uh, in, in uh, legal exper experts, especially in the Netherlands, who brought uh, yeah, their solutions uh, to, to Scotland. It's a bit funny that a small country like the Netherlands uh, could influence uh, yeah, the, the, uh, other countries, but it worked like that. Uh, what is a big difference that in common law, not uh, law books are central, but uh, yeah, the, the opinion by a judge. Uh, so people go to court um, and they ask the judge to give a solution. Now, uh, that's the origin of common law and the judge is central. And there is a system behind it. Uh, there's a uh, well, uh, precedence. Uh, the court will always look to past decisions of relevant courts. And uh, if the case is the same as an old case, then uh, they will uh, still uh, yeah, follow the old rules. Uh, only when there is a good reason, the court will develop a new rule. So uh, there's another way to approach the whole idea of law. And the whole thing is that, uh, yeah, uh, in, in the civil uh, civil law system, uh, ownership is a very abstract concept and uh, the supreme rights you can have uh, in land. While in the common law they say, no, yeah, ownership is more a bundle of rights or a bundle of sticks as they call it. So uh, yeah, a lot of interest uh, and uh, uh, yeah, you can give one stick to one person and a stick to another person. So there can be conflicting rights at the same time with giving all our uh, uh, powers to the land. And without going too deep, uh, what, you, what you also see is that they make a difference between equity and law. Um, and yeah, that gives more freedom than we have here on the mainland of Europe. And a good example is the trust. I think uh, everyone will uh, have heard about that. But the trust is that we have a legal owner, and that's the call the trustee, but there is someone who uh, benefits from it, the beneficiary, 
and that is called an uh, equitable uh, title. So there can be two right holders, someone who has the formal power, uh, the trustee, but there is someone who uh, benefits really from it. So uh, trust is not known in civil law. We have some concepts that look a bit like it, but the whole idea of the trust is not known in the Netherlands. Now, you will understand that at the moment that uh, in international trade, um, that can give some conflicts uh, because there is a company that, that uh, in, in England that holds land in, in uh, Europe and they want to put it in a trust. Yeah, then we have a problem and it's, uh, it's also sometimes resolved. Uh, can you register that trust in the, the Dutch land administration? And formally, no, because we don't know it. Um, yeah, zoom in, uh, mixed legal system. So uh, yeah, it is very uh, complex. Uh, again, uh, you are no, no lawyer, so uh, just be aware uh, that uh, when we're talking about land tenure, it has its influence on the system of land administration, uh, that you have to deep into the system, how it really works, and into the details to really understand it. And so be aware when we are talking about concepts that is very abstract and uh, the way uh, it really works will depend on the context. And so it can also be your, your time yeah? because the law is not so, something that, of course, it is a bit stable. Yeah? When uh, we have a court that will decide uh, tomorrow in a completely different way than yesterday, uh, we don't like that. Eh? So we want law to be stable, but it is not static. Eh? Things will change because society also will change. Okay, that, that was an introduction. Um, but now, yeah, when we're talking about rights, restrictions, and responsibilities, what, what do we really uh, mean with that? Uh, we're going to register and. Uh, the system of land administration. Uh, yeah, we want to know who, what, and where. So we want to register the RRRs. Um, and in fact, and then, yeah, uh, you will notice uh, I'm going to use an, uh, an uh, common law term: uh, interest in land. But it's very general. What do we mean? What do we mean with this? Um, now, the main thing is uh, the most complete right you can have, the most supreme right. Yeah, we call it uh, in uh, civil law ownership. And in common law, you will find the so-called freehold. Um, that's the highest right you can have. Um, I have to admit that someone from the common law, when he hears uh, speaking me like that, he cannot understand it. Uh, because uh, for them, yeah, uh, there is no complete right. Uh, you can say, oh, no, okay, I have a uh, collection of sticks that gives me a lot of powers, but uh, there is no one that has an absolute right. That's impossible. But freehold, you can compare with what we call uh, in uh, mainland Europe as ownership. And next to, to ownership, you can give others uh, use rights. And uh, yeah, I'm just uh, giving here some examples, like also last week, uh, the lease is very known in uh, the Netherlands. We know the Erfpacht, in Germany it is Erbaurecht. Um, yeah, there's a uh, right that is slightly less uh, than, uh, than the ownership, uh, owner itself, uh, but it gives a lot of use rights. So for instance, you can use it for, for to, uh, uh, to build houses on it. Um, in some countries, we also have specific building rights, for instance, used for tunneling or buildings above uh, roads. Uh, while that same concept is known in the common law, and especially in the United States, as air rights. So you can give someone the rights to a certain space of air, and you can build in it. So interesting about that is that it refers to a certain volume. Eh? And that's typically for the common law. At the moment, you're going to study uh, law in law school in, in the US or in uh, England. 
the first thing they will tell you that land is uh, something that has a value. Now, next, uh, yeah, the security rights. I talked a bit about it last time, and yeah, smaller, but also having their impact. And in fact, that's the restrictions you could say. Uh, servitude, easements uh, in in uh, the common law. You see the so-called restrictive covenants. It's in fact a contract, and yeah, those are uh, tools you could say used by a lawyer. Um, is uh, when you want uh, to have a building project uh, that you want to restrict the owner of the land. Uh, so you cannot build higher because you want to have a uh, skew of free view, or you want to use uh, as a neighbor to walk over the land, a footpath. Those are examples of uh, easements. Um, yeah, now I'm going to zoom in at that uh, three-dimensional aspect of uh, land ownership. Uh, I put also emphasis on it last time. Uh, what we see on a cadastral map is, of course, 2D, but in fact, keep in mind that it's all about the space. And to illustrate that, um, I'm going to... Uh, uh, England to London, a uh, nice thing is uh, when you go to uh, the, uh, the metro, the metropolitan railway or the tube as they call it. Um, yeah, sometimes you find uh, very funny railway stations, uh, metro stations like uh, bank, a curve. Yeah, why is it curved? And it has all, everything to do with uh, the land ownership. What they want to do is to avoid that they had to uh, tunnel, and they're using at that time uh, uh, tunneling machines. In the beginning, they started to dig, uh, like they did in Delft a few years ago. Uh, you start to dig from uh, the surface, you go uh, deeper and deeper, and then you close it off, you put a roof on it. But uh, in the beginning, uh, the end uh, of the 19th century, beginning 20th century, they invented the uh, tunnel boring machine. But uh, you, then you could say, uh, as an engineer, uh, okay, but then you can just bore a tunnel straight on under the houses. Wrong. Um, because those houses are owned by someone, the land is owned by someone, and the ownership of the land also gives the right to the subsurface. So if you want to bore under the land of someone, yeah, you have to negotiate to get a deal, to get permission to go under that house. You cannot just bore under the in the land of someone else. Um, if I have to get permission, what do I need? Very simply. Will someone just grant me permission to uh, go under the house, my house? I know it is your topic, eh? so you should <laughs> provide an answer. Yeah, uh, the answer is of course no, and that someone <laughs> wants. Yeah, you want to a compensation, so you need to pay a lot of money. And that's the reason that uh, the, even, even what they call in London the deep level lines are following uh, magnetic roads. Uh, there are some examples I took from this uh, nice uh, thesis. If you have time, uh, search for it and then uh, read it. It's also, by the way, uh, not only from a uh, legal point of view or the, 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 the land administration, but also from the technical aspects. There's a lot of more to talk about it, but it gives some nice uh, maps um, where you can see that they just follow the roads yeah. you should, and that's an explanation here here's the, the situation around the piccadilly circus uh, that uh, explains why you find those uh, curves they wanted to avoid to build to construct a tunnel under the road uh, sorry under the private uh, owned lands Um, yeah, then I will start. Uh, that was all in a nutshell. 
eh, about the uh, rights, restrictions, and responsibilities. But now we go back to the system. Uh, yeah, what are the aims of the land administration now? Uh, last week we saw that uh, answer on that uh, who, what, and where question. Um, after seeing that video, uh, who owns England, we know that the answer is not always that we can get all the information we want. But there is a system that um, uh, yeah, contains uh, the information, who, what, and where. And when we're looking uh, in history, you could say that, that uh, the whole idea of, of uh, yeah, uh, having a system that gives the government or the people in power, I must say, um, that information, there's nothing very recent, but it was thousands of years ago, was already there. And the, 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 the oldest we know, we have some information about is in Egypt. Uh, we have here a nice picture of the rope structures, as they're called. Surveyors at work, um, they're going to measure, uh, yeah, well, where, where's the land? And uh, Egypt was uh, uh, very based on agriculture. Sorry, again, that uh, word I cannot uh, pronounce. Um, but around the Niles, farmers uh, were having the crops. And what they did is that after every year, after the Nile, uh, that we had to measure again. Uh, the, the, the fields. So there was a system. And of course, the system, why, why did it do that? Why did they want that information? The most obvious answer is taxation. And you want money of the people who are making profits from the land. And the, 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 the government can also good, do good things, build uh, uh, nice monuments, for instance. Um, yeah, so you want some information. Uh, you want to collect it. And so this picture was, uh, uh, this drawing, uh, painting, was found in the tomb of one of those people who did this work. Um, the Romans, the same. Um, and uh, I always find this very funny that uh, yeah, there are people who say that, that uh, the parcels that were made by the Roman surveyors, uh, yeah, those parcel boundaries have still an influence on the actual parcel boundaries. I don't know if this really true, but uh, this is from a dissertation PhD that was written about the city uh, in Forburg, so not far from Delft. And what he says is that uh, when you look at that map uh, uh, from uh, 1712, um, that the whole um, division of the land that was in the Roman time uh, based on an uh, 35 and a half meters yeah, that is still there in the parcels boundaries uh, at that time and that should also influence the parcel boundaries that you can find uh, until now so if this really true, true i don't know but i find it very fascinating that an uh, empire that disappeared uh, about uh, two thousand years ago yeah, that the whole uh, administration still influence uh, the way uh, we divide the, 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 the parcels to, uh, until uh, today. Now I make a big uh, lap and then we have a break. Um, yeah, so there was always a uh, kind of administration, uh, maybe one system better than the other. But Napoleon uh, wanted uh, to, to have a very good system, to improve the system. So he wanted to uh, have a system that uh, yeah, gave the French government information about the ownership, uh, the use and the value of the land. And especially it was for fair taxation. Uh, so he could get money and he wanted money to invest into in, in his army, but um, he wanted to, tax, uh, to, to get that money in a fair way. So that's uh, not uh, one uh, uh, owner was paying more money uh, per square meter than the other. So you must know uh, how much meters uh, everyone had. And of course, you will also want to sell the taxation bill to the real owner. So that was um, uh, the basic 
uh, idea of his uh, system to introduce a cadaster. Uh, on the other hand, he also recognized that it was also to support the real estate market by, by offering uh, legal security. Eh? Um, you're uh, willing to buy uh, a piece of land only when you know that, that uh, yeah, the person who's trying to sell to you is also the real owner. It is not someone who pretends to be the owner. No. How can you prove that? Now, if you have a good system of land administration, um, yeah, that's a support. So what he did was uh, sending uh, his surveyors uh, all over the country, all over the empire, and that was uh, uh, supported by uh, this book. Yeah, uh, this, uh, uh, a collection of all the laws, uh, all the directives, uh, uh, relating to, to the introduction and also the maintenance of the cadastre of France. Uh, that was uh, printed in uh, 1811. And at that time, uh, the Netherlands was also part of the French Empire. So we started working with this uh, French uh, laws. And yeah, that is the foundation of this, um, uh, what, what is called uh, uh, the cadastral concept. Um, yeah. What do we have? In fact, on the one hand, we have this: uh, we have uh, the legal documents uh, proving uh, or uh, yeah, proving the transactions between people. So this continues updated. And on the other hand, we have the the, the mapping, uh, the, the the way to to uh, identify that uh, uh, pieces of land, uh, the parcels with the boundaries, and everything connected to it is in fact very simplified. You can say that that's a cadastre, that is the whole information. And uh, now of course, that is uh, as Peter explained his business. Yeah, we are building uh, databases so we can uh, make this uh, uh, very efficient. So it is an ongoing process. We could say now for 200 years, uh, starting from Napoleon and still going on to improve those systems, but still based on, on this cadastral concept. Okay, it is now uh, half past uh, 11, so it is time for a break of 15 minutes, and then I will have, uh, look, have a closer look at the system of land administration from a bit different uh, 